to the next section in that case, which is really just a preparatory section, and it's trying to, you know, after this section we'll move on to the, on to the whole area of desire for God, but it's just trying to get, uh, make contact with Bernard as a thinker, the way that he approached things, and in particular as a monastic teacher as somebody who knew about monastic life and had something to say about it. So when we, we start reading his spiritual doctrines, to believe that he was a person who had two feet on the ground, who knew what monks were like, who knew the sort of stuff that monks needed to hear if they were to be helped in their life. So the problem that we're facing in this particular section is just another introductory one. We're not quite sure what Bernard is often coming at. He seems to be very severe and very harsh, and anybody who wants to wave the stick and, and propagate the hard line in monastic life, um, de Rancé included, can always quote a text from St. Bernard. And we get a bit fed up with this sort of stuff, you know. Um, you know, he's a great friend of abbots to, to beat the monks with, you know, as our Holy Father St. Bernard said, um, and so forth. You know, for anything, if they want to sleep in, if they want extra food, um, you know, there's always a text in Bernard. And so this is another reason why many monastic people feel a little bit of a, a resentment uh, if they're beaten, beaten with Bernard in this way. And so a lot of our men in the community say, oh, don't give me that Bernard stuff, you know. Oh, God, you know, our order is humility and poverty. And da, 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 da. <laughs> so let's try and, and, and find out what Bernard was actually like on the monastic level. Okay, one of the aspects of Bernard's writing that causes some difficulty is his use of irony. He does not hesitate to heap ridicule and abuse on those who disagree with him, caricaturing their positions, declaiming mordantly and trenchantly at their expense, and occasionally overflowing into satire. To us, Anglo-Saxons, well, I don't know, I don't know if you'd hardly call yourself Anglo-Saxons, would you, most of you? So to me, an Anglo-Saxon, or the, the fashionable phrase in Australia now is Anglo-Celtic. Mm. To, to me, Anglo-Celtic that I am, this is a breach of polite discourse that is wounding and unhelpful in resolving difficulties. You know, you can think of the Abbot General. If he wants to say something, he would come and say, well, there seems to be some slight problem in, these in this community that the brethren murdering each other and so <laughs> forth. Um, whereas Bernard would come and, uh, come and scream, you know, that the, 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 the place is going to rack and ruin uh, because somebody left the door open. You know, there's exaggeration and understatement. <laughs> the Anglo-Saxon tradition generally tends to go towards understatement, saying things quietly and meaning a lot more. Uh, Bernard, which we find hard to take, seems to say everything extravagantly with a great deal of passion and a great deal of heat. And people say, what in the hell are you getting on about, you know? It's a breach of polite discourse that is wounding and unhelpful in resolving difficulties. Worse than that, it seems to be expressive of a single-minded bigotry that is incompatible with Christian charity. So St. Bernard is the patron of Saint of Bigots. Uh, you could look at plenty of texts and find him giving out about uh, you know, exactly what he wanted. And um, Jean Leclerc has written an excellent essay on this subject in his Nouveau Visage. Irony is not what it seems. It's not a distancing mechanism as satire is. And so he's distinguishing between irony and satire. Satire is, is, is uh, caricaturing another in order to keep your distance in order to heap abuse at them, in order to, to distinguish myself from them. Irony is something different. Uh, irony is a paradoxical means of advancing 
a positive value by concentrating on its opposite. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, about humility. And what's a good way of talking about humility? Well, you can describe the way that pride acts in people or arrogance acts in people. And what it's really doing is it's just a negative way of discourse. And this is exactly what St. Bernard does. The most memorable parts of his treatise on humility and pride is are precisely when he starts sketching out the way down, the way that pride acts in, in the lives of monks. And he apologizes for that in his Retractatio. But, but um, it's a, a means. It presupposes a, a certain shared context of belief and value. And I think that, that's worth... Uh, writing here. That satire, you can satirize um, other people, um, Eskimos or Mexicans or New Zealanders, uh, and it's to dismiss them, as to say, Here, you, you know, they're hopeless, they never wash their socks. Um, they eat too many onions in their diet and so forth. You can, you can satirize them and exaggerate. And it's, it's keeping people at a, at a distance. Whereas irony doesn't do that at all. It sounds a little bit like it, but it presupposes that you and I, reader and writer, have similar values. Uh, and and that's, that's an important thing. And of those various words, I think, the one we need to remember is that irony is about values. It's not about facts. It's about uh, values in living. I can't, can't get over there. It presupposes a certain shared context of b value and belief between author and his readership, <coughs> an appreciation of the rules of the genre, Always in the Middle Ages, people knew what to expect uh, in any piece of writing. And I still think it's true uh, that the be a, a good piece of writing is a piece that really conforms to its genre. Uh, if I have to um, give a lecture, well, it should be a lecture and not something else. If I, if I have to give a homily, it should be a homily. It shouldn't be a comment on people who leave the door open and, and let the heat go out. If I have to uh, um, give an address on one occasion or another, I should conform to the particular style of that. And so often bad writing or bad speaking comes simply from the intrusion of alien elements. Now, this was brought home very, very, very strongly to me um, a couple of years ago, or whenever it was that the Pope was in Australia, that a very close friend of mine was uh, had to give the address of welcome on behalf of, of, of religious. And um, I said to her after, it was, it was just so good, and she got heaps and heaps of mail from people just saying what a wonderful address it was, even though it only lasted a minute or a minute and a half or something. Uh, what most people didn't know, that she submitted it in advance to the Vatican, and then on the morning she got up, she said she couldn't give that old talk, so she wrote a new one. <laughs> and all the cardinals were there looking to... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, was, it was a really extraordinary and very warm word of welcome, and that's all it was, was a word of welcome. But she didn't try and do anything else but that. In other words, she just stuck to that. She did it very well, very politely, uh, and as representative of all the religious in Australia, she evoked that kind of element as well. But in other words, she kept exactly to the mandate. She didn't make a, um, a statement on the environment. <laughs> she didn't, didn't, didn't do anything else but simply conform to what, uh, for the type of message that was expected, and so it worked. And so she ended up saying unspoken far more <laughs> because people reacted to her as a person uh, because she wasn't obtruding herself into the message. And I think it's an important point. Uh, a business letter is a business letter. Uh, it's, it, it, if it corresponds to its genre, it will probably get the desired result. A sermon is a sermon. Uh, an address of welcome uh, or whatever it is 
is, is an address of welcome. And I think that's one of the things that they knew in the Middle Ages, they knew their genres of writing. And as a result, when they picked up, when they picked up a, a piece of irony, they didn't think it was descriptive. They took for granted what it was. Let's just move on. So they appreciated the rules of the genre and the common ability to gauge the meanings of words even when used hyperbolically. Uh, even when there is a lot of exaggera exaggeration. It's spirited discourse, and it's not for the sensitive and literal-minded. But it is more than carping recrimination. By exaggeration, understood by all parties to be such, it's hoped that the attention will be so focused on a particular point uh, that the need for positive action becomes apparent. Now, I'm going to go further and say that irony respects the freedom of the person to whom I'm, st I'm, I'm talking, and you'll see how. Understood properly, irony is not unkind or insensitive. To condemn monks for gormandizing is usually an exaggeration. If I get up out here, there are people eating, e eating crustaceans for breakfast in some monasteries, and that is... Now, everybody knows, if you've got half a wit in your head, that that's exaggeration. Not many of us have lobster for breakfast. I mean, caviar maybe, but certainly not lobster. <laughs> um, who's around to cook it? But the thing is, what happens is that I, I get up here and say, there's a certain convent of nuns in Canada where they have lobster every morning for, for, for mixed. <laughs> and everybody says, oh, gee, that's terrible. Oh, gee, yeah, that's a bit, bit beyond it. Now, that's the first process. You're condemning this imaginary convent, huh? The readers also condemn such excess, but in the process of so doing, they begin formulating within themselves the reasons why monastic people should be abstemious in diet. So in other words, nobody is actually eating lobster for breakfast, but by, by raising the subject in a harmless way, in other words, by exaggerating so much that nobody could possibly feel threatened, we begin to think about values. If the process continues in it to its term, such strength and values issue forth in practice, and they say, perhaps I do need to exercise more vigilance in the matter of food. Now, can you see what's happening? You overstate a case so that, in fact, nobody is threatened. You can say, Phew, at least I haven't gone that far. We only have prawns and, uh, you know, uh, uh, lobster, no. The irony has done its work, it has reminded the reader of a value without overtly mentioning it, and has motivated him to express that value in some way in his own life. It's thus more delicate and respecting of personal freedom than a bald statement, some monks are eating 500 grams of bread for breakfast, according to the traditions of our order and the decrees of the general chapter, 100 grams is sufficient. You make a statement like that, and, and, and people are st starting to feel condemned. There's a, in the good old days in Ross Cray, there's a very scrupulous brother who was refectorian, used to weigh every, every slice of bread, especially during Lent, and if it were the slightest bit overweight, he would cut the corner off it, you know, because he couldn't give a monk more than whatever it was, two ounces of bread. But, I mean, you start talking in this way, that people are doing this and... and Everybody has to either defend themselves and say, what's wrong with having an extra slice of bread? Or, alternatively, say, well, you know, I better stop eating it. I better do what I'm told. Whereas irony just simply builds up a colourful picture of the value itself by dwelling on the opposite, by dwelling on the vice of gormandizing. In fact, very few monks, uh, very few monasteries have, have a cuisine of of, of, of such standard that you'd be inclined to be tempted to go and dies, but um, <laughs> uh, generally speaking. And so it's not a real problem, but by talking about monks as though they were always doing such things, then it reminds us to think of our values. This sort of statement is... Irony operates at the level of belief and value. It leaves the details of practical implementation open. Rightly understood, it is kinder, less threatening, and more effective than, than bald administrative declarations. 
And so we might just go straight down to the text at the bottom of this page and, um, and we'll just see how Bernard operates. This is from his third Advent sermon, talking about people who want to have parties at Christmas. And, um, disgusting. And um, so how does he handle it? And it's a very interesting text. Now, a few things to say before we start to read it. That um, generally, remember what we said, that Bernard didn't have much. He was a little unbalanced when it came to food. He didn't have much interest in him himself. And he couldn't understand why other people did. Well, having accepted that. Now, we'll try and listen to what value he's talking about. So we'll just read the first paragraph and we'll come back on the second one. Now what I'd like to do with these texts is to get a volunteers to read them. Now I'm aware that some of you may be less comfortable reading English than others, so uh, if those that are comfortable reading English <laughs> could be uh, unmonastic enough to volunteer, um, <laughs> um, then we could go. So could we have a volunteer to read? Okay. Let us swing it around. Just the first paragraph. For them, these days will be kept out of lifeless custom, without any experience of devotion or love. What is even more worthy of reproach is the fact that they make occasion of this feast for the pleasures of the flesh. During these days, you will see them much taken up with the splendor of their clothes and the preparation of fine foods. It is as though they sought to receive Christ more worthily on his birthday, by such diligent efforts. But listen to what he himself has to say. I shall not eat with the man of proud looks and haughty heart. Why do you prepare clothing with such vanity for my birthday? I am not attracted by vanity. I detest it. Why do you get such a vast supply of food ready for this time? The delights of the flesh are unacceptable to me, and I condemn them. Your haughty heart cannot be satisfied. You prepare so much, so long in advance, whereas the body requires only a little of what is readily available. In celebrating my coming, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. It is not me that you worship, for your belly is your God, and your glory is your shame. Utter woe to the one who does worship to bodily pleasure and the emptiness of worldly fame. But blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Yeah, so that'd be nice good news to, to read out in the church, wouldn't it? during Advent <laughs> to all these people making Christmas puddings and so forth and, and getting their clothes prepared. Cake. Buying cake, fruit cakes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's exaggerating. I mean, nobody's going to take that literally. I mean, he can say that if he wants to, but nobody's going to make the slightest difference to anyone's behaviour. But in fact, he's not talking about monks in this case. He's talking to monks and he's talking about outsiders. And he's saying, just think of the way in which they prepare for Christmas. They prepare for Christmas by stocking up on all sorts of foods and by getting nice clothes and getting themselves ready for a big long party. But how are you going to prepare for Christmas? And that's really the point that he's getting at. He's talking fairly safely and they all say, oh, what terrible people they are, buying fruitcakes and so forth. And uh, now he moves into a very interesting passage in which he tries to, 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 to bring out the value. Let's just read the bit at the bottom of the page that may help. This extract shows clearly the workings of the device. Bernard begins by painting a picture of an inappropriate response to Advent, so describing it that he appears to be talking about outsiders. So he's not talking about you, no, you're lovely people. But those people outside there, they're terrible people. This is the sort of way they prepare. So that the monks can safely agree that such excess is to be deplored. Although there may be the first stirrings of conscience as the underlying values begin to surface. So they begin to say, well, Advent really isn't a time for food and clothes and so forth. There's a more deep meaning, there's more profound meaning to Advent. 
and then the camera, like the camera, it swings around from the outsiders onto the monks and says, OK, how are you going to prepare for Advent? Of course, he says, this has got nothing to do with you. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this was your problem, he says, because you're monks, you, you don't have this problem. Uh, and then he goes on to ask them to interrogate their own conscience. After touching ever so lightly on the problem, he goes to provide its remedy, their own conscience, their awareness of vocation, the direction they had freely and knowingly given to their lives. So he says, when we come to Advent, what we're really looking to is to try and locate our life, our response on the level of conscience. And how do you do that? By going back to your own sense of vocation and who you are. Uh, their own conscience, their awareness of vocation, the direction they had freely and knowingly given to their lives. So what he does is simply, he doesn't accuse them of any, any excess, but simply reminds them of the basic purpose and direction of their life basic goal of their life, which is something different from this. It's not just to have fine food and nice clothes, it's something different. You go on in the second paragraph then to say, look at your own conscience. Uh, to solve this question, he sketched these awful people that, that spend Advent inappropriately, and now he's going to say, but you're different. Look at your own conscience, make contact with your own sense of vocation, see where you're going with your life and you'd soon see that this kind of behaviour is inappropriate. OK, would you like to read the next one? Brothers, do not fret because of the wicked. Do not envy those who do evil. Rather, understand what will happen to them at the end. Have a sincere compassion for them, and pray for all those whose only interest is in sin. These unhappy men act this way because they have no understanding of God. For if they had knowledge of him, they would never have set the Lord of glory against themselves by such idiocies. But when it comes to us, dear brothers, there is no question of our being excused because of ignorance. It is clear that each one of you here has knowledge of him, who is it that has led you to this place? How is it that you have arrived here? How else could you have been persuaded to renounce of your own free will the affection of your friends, the pleasures of the body, and the vanities of the world? How else could you have been led to cast all your thoughts on the Lord and to make over to him all your concerns? since, as your own conscience testifies, you merited nothing good but only punishment. I repeat, who could have persuaded you of this unless you knew that the Lord is good to all who hope in him, to the heart which seeks him, unless you had recognized for yourself that the Lord is gentle and kind and full of mercy and faithfulness. How else could you have known these things unless the Lord had come not only to you, but into you? So he's, do you see what he's doing? Is the, is the process quite clear? He's saying, look at your own sense of call. He says, all right, these are for people, this way of acting, of having celebrations at Christmas and seeing it simply as a secular festival, he says, that's for people who have no understanding of, of, of spiritual things, no understanding of God. He says, this couldn't possibly be true of you because what in the hell are you doing here? People don't end up in a monastery um, just because they've got nowhere to sleep. They don't end up in a monastery because th they didn't know the gun was loaded sort of thing. But it's a very determined process that leads us to the monastery. And, of course, if, you, if anyone you says, I know him not, that's what Peter said, he's a liar. For if you had no knowledge of him, who, who is it that has led you to this place? How is it that you have arrived here? What are you doing here? Uh, and we know the story that William has of, of Bernard that says that he addressed to himself the 
continually the question Christ addressed to Judas and Benedict addressed to priests. Ad quid venisti, why have you come to this place? And what he's saying is, look to your basic purpose in life and, and, and learn to live from that. See where you came. What is it that's led you to this place? You didn't come here by accident. So look to that. That's the first stage. How else? And he, say, he stresses it a number of times. Look at all the things you gave up, all the good things, all the pleasurable things, all the uh, gratifying things that you gave up to come here. Nobody would do that unless there was something on the other side of the scale to plonk it down. You can't say that you don't know God, you can't say that you don't know the will of God, because obviously you do. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And so he's saying, interrogate your own conscience, interrogate your own sense of vocation on this matter. Is Christmas simply a time of celebration of, of, uh, on, at a secular level, or is it something more spiritual? Is, that, is, the, is the process clear? Do you see what he's getting at? Because it's, it's an important one. It's not just simply, he sketches out, like, he puts a lot of trouble, people preparing big pots of brew and beautiful clothes and putting up streamers and getting out the, 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 the whiskey and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's Christmas for them. And he's saying, well, listen, and we all say, oh, well, Christmas is more than that. And he's saying, it should be more than that for you too, as Max and try and get down to where it really is. Try and really understand, get to, used to assessing what you do from the basis of God's action within you, from the fact that you have a knowledge of God which you don't always operate from. And it's that knowledge which we can tell because it's, it's got visible effects. I mean, there are one, two, three, four, five people here that don't have knowledge of God, and you can see the empty chairs. They haven't come here. <laughs> They didn't arrive here. But you that are here, what are you doing in the monastery? And because of the fact that you're here, it must be that you have something that, that brought you here, some goal. And if you can get into contact with that goal, then progressively your decisions about uh, various elements of, 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 you might say, practical living uh, will be more founded in, in your own identity and who you are and so forth. But you can read some of these texts later. And let's just go on to page four for a couple of minutes that remain to us. Bernard seems to enjoy poking fun at the shortcomings of monks. And it's likely that his readers took no offence at his jibes. I mean, you often, you, you hear a novice being given the steps of humility and pride for, for Lenten reading. And then you can hear him giggling all through Lent. Um, because it is funny, and they are clever little pictures of monks, and we, we know who he's talking about. I mean, if we were in our own monastery, we could put names on them. But that's the genius. They probably wasn't talking about anybody exact, but it looks like a kind of universal archetype. He enjoyed poking fun at the shortcomings of monks, and it seems likely that his readers took no offence at his jibes, which, though pointed, were probably not aimed at individuals. Bernard had no qualms about confronting monks directly if he thought they needed correction. I mean, he had a very strong boot, and if they needed a kick, he'd give it to them. Uh, he didn't need to give sermons about it. <laughs> he, he was into direct action. Hmm? These entertaining vignettes are better regarded as general declarations of value than as snide uh, anonymous attacks. You know, it would be a very petty little man preaching on the Song of Songs who would start trying to pay back a few of his enemies in the community by, 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 by nasty remarks. They are found from time to time in the sermons on the Song of Songs as artifices to give the illusion the sermons are actually preached. Okay, would somebody like to read the next one there? 30, from the sermon 36.7. I had thought that it would have been possible for me to have completed my promised discourse on the two forms of ignorance, and I would have done so except that it would have seemed too long to those who have had enough. I notice that some of you are yawning, and others are nodding off to sleep. I am not surprised, since last night's vigils were very long, 
so they have some excuse. However, what am I to say to those who were asleep then, and are still asleep now? I will go no further, lest I increase their embarrassment. It is enough to have touched on the matter. I am sure that they will do better at vigils in the future, for fear of receiving a burning rebuke from me. So for the moment, I shall leave things be. So he's, he's just saying, well, you know, you've got no reason to sleep during my lectures because you're fast asleep all through vigils. <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing. It's not really intended at anybody, but it's just a restatement of values. Um, the next one... I might read myself because it's a little long and I'm probably more familiar with it and might leave out some parts on the way. So if you see me jump, you'll know um, we're getting over time. This is for, for those who suffer from hypochondria, uh, who worry too much about their health and not unknown in monasteries, health food and all that kind of stuff. What have you got to say about this, you who are so careful about your food and so careless about your morals? Hippocrates and his followers teach us to save our lives in this world, whereas Christ and his disciples teach us to lose our lives. Which of these two do you elect to have as master? There is no doubt about whose disciple is the one who says, this is bad for my eyes and this is for my head and this for my chest and that for my stomach. For everyone speaks according to what he's learned from his master. Such fussiness is not in the Gospels, nor in the Prophets, nor in the letters of the Apostles. Certainly it is flesh and blood which have revealed such wisdom, not the Spirit of the Father. For this is the wisdom of the flesh. And hear what our physicians have to say about that. The wisdom of the flesh is death, they say. And the wisdom of the flesh is hostile to God. Should I be setting before you the teaching of Hippocrates or Galen or that of the school of Epicurus? No, for I am a disciple of Christ, and it is to the disciples of Christ that I address myself. Should I introduce some strange tenets, then it is I myself who sin. Epicurus and Hippocrates are concerned about the body, its pleasure or its good health, but for both such conditions my master proclaim contempt. And so he goes on. We'll just go down to the third paragraph. That true um, wisdom is not directed to pleasurable living. You can hear from that saying of the wise man, which states that no wisdom is found among those who live softly. Whereas one who did find it said, I have loved wisdom more than health or beauty. If wisdom is to be loved more than health and beauty, how much more is it to be preferred to pleasure and filth? Furthermore, what profit is there in controlling one's desire for pleasure if one gives oneself over to a daily concern for studying the different types and combinations of foods? Such a one says, beans give me wind, cheese upsets my stomach, milk is bad for my head, drinking water weakens the heart, cabbage induces melancholy, leeks get me stirred up, fish from ponds or muddy water disagree with me entirely. How is it that in all the rivers and fields and gardens and storehouses there is scarcely anything to be found which may be eaten and won't cause cancer? Please remember this, you are a monk, not a physician. You will be judged not for your health, but for your living of your profession. I beg you to let up. For your own peace of mind, for the sake of those who have to look after you, to avoid being a burden to the house, and for the sake of conscience, not so much your own as the one who sits and, and eats what is set before him and who murmurs because of your singular refusal to eat. He is scandalised since he thinks that you are superstitious, making an issue about inessentials, and so forth. But Bernard loved doing that kind of thing, and obviously he's exaggerating. And the, the, the phrase, there's scarcely anything to be found in the whole world which may be eaten, occurs in passages in nearly all the monastic reformers. But the idea is not really to say, oh, thank God I'm not, I'm not that bad, but to ask ourselves where we place our priorities. Do we place it with our health and our well-being uh, and our convenience, or do we place it on our service to Christ? 
And if there is a choice, there isn't always a choice, but if there is a choice, on which do we make it? And you see, what, what he's doing, he's taking these issues and asking us to relate them to the general context of our life, the principle that governs my activity. What is it? And uh, it's not really giving uh, strong teaching about, uh, uh, about diet or anything like that, but he's asking us to view all these questions in a, in a more general context. And so there's another diatribe in, in 3310, and all the passages come from about the same time in Bernard's life, which is rather interesting. And, uh, well, this afternoon we'll look at some of those ones from the ap uh, Apologia. Uh, but we're about time at the moment, so we might just call that a day. But some of these passages might, are worthwhile just reading over again, just trying to get, go back to that thing of he's talking about values, and particularly about locating my private and personal decisions for small actions within the context of the whole direction of my life. If we get that, we'll know a very great trick about Bernard's teaching, because that's what he's operating on.